Welcome back to Team Pandori. The Retro Pocket 3 was a great handheld for the price, but some people just wanted that little bit more power. Enter the Retro Pocket 3 Plus. Looks extremely similar, but what can we do with the extra grunt? In today's review, we'll find out just how much we can push it, and if this is the handheld for 2022. This is Emi Chicken, and welcome to Team Pandori. Subscribe. So this package arrived from DHL. We've got a cardboard box in a bag that's been opened by the customs. Inside this box, we've got foam and another box. This is just like past the parcel. Only this fun. What we get here is identical to the Retro Pocket 3. We can just slide it out like this. And we have this very skimpy manual. Not the most useful, but it is what it is. We get a USB-C charging cable. And while it's quite thick, we can't use it to send data. Let's get to the handheld. There's a screen protector. And here's a Retro Pocket 3 in translucent blue. And it's very nice indeed. Let's have a closer look. On the bottom we have stereo speakers, one on either side, a micro SD card slot, a USB-C, and a 3.5mm headphone jack. On the side here we have a home button. And moving to the top, we've got stacked shoulder buttons and the triggers are digital, not analog. Both start selects are up here, but we did get used to them fairly quickly on the RP3. There's a micro HDMI port and power. On the other side we've got volume up and down. And on the back we have some holes. And as you can see through the cover, it just looks very pretty. My favorite type of girly underwear. It's very light and it feels great in the hands. Has analog clickies and the D-pad has low travel and you can get to the corners quite easily. Let's have a listen. There's a bit more travel to these buttons and they feel pretty decent. And the shoulder buttons. To reiterate, these are not analog. Always use protection. That's a pretty decent job. Now for the boot time. Hello, I'm Jean. What's orange and sounds like a parrot? A carrot. Say, haven't we had this handheld on before? I really like the color this time, it makes me want to sing. Blue, blue, my world is blue. Blue is my world. Now I am giving out awesome massages. Would you like a coupon? Just over 28 seconds. Next thing we've got to do is set this up. So at first boot, we need to choose language, give it the Wi-Fi details, choose if you want to use Google Play or not, and then which applications you want pre-installed. Unfortunately, from this point onwards, it's not exactly hands-free, but if you do need some help, Russ from Retro Game Cops has created a guide. There are no games included, but we can copy our own to a microSD, then scan using their front end. If successful, it'll also add the cover art, and then we'll be able to run it very easily. Let's get to some game testing. First up is some early arcade action. Source 1942. And Neo Geo is pretty much flawless. And for fighting games, this D-pad works really well. Hadoukens, no problem here. And using main for droid, we got 60 FPS out of Tekken 2. And even Tekken Tag Tournament is fully playable. But Killer Instinct, on the other hand, sorry, not here. And here are some shooters from Cave. Next up, computers. Here's the Amiga. Jim Power title screen is running at 41 frames a second. 
But when you're in game, full speed. And even demos like Nine Fingers run flawlessly. Some games to the PC now. Here's Raptor. And Command and Conquer, Red Alert. And don't forget we have ScumVM with touchscreen support. Laverne's covering that territory. And open Beats of Rage. Next up are handhelds from Nintendo. Everything from Game Boy to DS, this runs no problem. And that includes using the DS touchscreen. If we move on to the 3DS, we do actually see some performance dips. Now let's move to the Nintendo consoles. Anything up to the N64 runs very well. N64 is always a tricky one to emulate, but as the system uses Android and it's pretty powerful, it can go as far as upscaling to 2 or 3 times resolution and it's still very playable. On the GameCube, Mario Kart Double Dash does actually run pretty well, but performance depends on which game is being played. Here's some Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes. You can see that the speed dips to 90%. And everyone's favourite, F-Zero GX. With GameCube being hit and miss, Here's some Mario Kart Black on the Nintendo Wii. Depending on the renderer used, it's at 50 to around 8% speed. But when switching to our favourite, Rhythm Heaven Fever, yeah, this is pretty much perfect. Some of the WiiWare also works quite well, except for the occasional slowdown. Now for the Sega consoles. Here's Sonic 2 on the Mega Drive. Sega 32X. No problems here. Sega CD. This can even run Sega Saturn games at two times resolution. Next up is Dreamcast, and every game we tried ran great, even with upscaling. Oh, 
And that even includes Yu Suzuki's works. And everyone's favourite, Capcom vs SNK2. There's some Sega Naomi. And a Thomas Wave. Next section is for Sony consoles. Most games you can run at double or triple resolution. But there will be slowdown if we use double or triple resolution with PGXP enhancements. If you turn the PGXP off, this runs like butter. Now for some PlayStation 2. This may be a good choice for RPGs or easier to play games, but it's definitely a hit and miss scenario. You may not notice here, but Dragon Quest 8 does have a little slowdown. Dawn, on the other hand, runs perfectly. As does Gradius V. And here's Gran Turismo 4. When there are many cars in view, the game does slow down. We have to faff with the settings to get decent speed. Tekken Tag Tournament is very slow, but again, if we change the options, better, but still not 100%. But if we try Tekken 4, it's running a bit better. Now how about Tekken 5? Moving on to PSP now, 99% of the games worked with at least two times resolution, full speed, with no frame skip. If Wipeout pulses at three times resolution, the special effects do slow it down a little. So two times resolution, perfect. It's Tekken 6. As you can see, the first punch is slow, and then after that, full speed ahead. Midnight Club 3, Dub Edition. And of course, God of War. There are problems with Killzone Liberation, but that is a problem with the emulator itself, and not with a handheld. Moving on to the Android side, here's Apex Legends. Call of Duty Mobile. Genshin Impact. League of Legends Wild Rift. Minecraft. GTA Vice City Psycho Boy With Tita Pro, we can use the gyroscope. And there's also a microphone in the device so we can tune our guitar. And as this handheld has dual band Wi Fi, we can easily stream Steam. 
you not played this game yet, where have you been? It's brilliant. Outside games we can always check out a good cartoon. DuckTales, Sexy Commando, or even this crazy one called Golden Boy. If you want to use controllers, we can use Bluetooth ones, just by holding this button here and then pairing it with our controller. This SM30 Pro works in the menu and in games. If you want to use a wired controller, we can use one of these dongles and connect it to the USB port. When hooking up to a TV, you'll get a 720p signal, which works rather well. And if you want to be a bit more experimental, how about two-player PlayStation 2? Asuka is just my type. Don't tell Beverly. She will take my lunch money. So what are the big differences between these two? Well, obviously, we've got a more powerful unit, but they look pretty much identical. The D-pad is exactly the same, but there is a big difference with these buttons. Little clicky, and longer clicky. And we have an extra button we push down on the analog sticks. We also noticed a huge difference with the sound. We then ran a speaker polarity test on YouTube and found out the speakers were incorrectly set up on the Plus. That means we have little bass and poor sound, which was not the case on the 3. And if you too have this sound problem, we'd like to hear from you in the comment section. To fix this problem, we'll need to open it up, take one of the speakers out, then we need to switch the red and the black wire. We made a big mess. But somehow, we got there in the end. How are you still alive? There we have it. Fixed. But Retroid should sort this out in the factory before any more is sent out. We also noticed there was a slightly less vibrant display than the older model. But it is still nice and bright with some good detail. And we cannot forget about the huge step forward when it comes to support for the new graphics chipset. We get far less glitching and system-wide Vulkan support. One more thing to add is with both systems we get around 10 hours of Tekken 3. About time for the pros and the cons. Let's face it, this thing is great value. I mean, it's about time that we can get double or even triple resolution in most PSP games with little to no faffing. And with this solid build of Android 12 on it, with Google Play, possibilities are endless. As for the cons, yes, there was a problem with the speakers. It is a fairly easy fix, but still very faffy. And the same goes for setting up the front end. In the future, we'd like to see more of a hands-free setup as the initial installation really does drag on. So. Can we recommend this handheld? Yes. If you have the patience to set this unit up, it is the cheapest and best way to play PSP for around $150. While I play a bit of Tekken 6, here's a big thank you to all of those on our Patreon. Thank you. We do our best creating video reviews like this, as well as tutorials, and fix them A500 minis, and them small Chinese arcade things. Would you like me to take over? Yeah. I'm going to be on tour in my Vauxhall course, so if you want a rub down from John Luke, get me up. Okay. So if you enjoyed this video, please hit the like, subscribe, and bell. And this has been Amy Chicken of Team Poundory, and I'll catch you on the next one. Ta-ra. Brom, brom, pretty girls only. John Luke out.